Dustin Hoffman once tried to keep things real, really real, by making fun of his co-star's dead boyfriend and slapping her in the face, allegedly. If that wasn't shocking enough, his co-star was Meryl Streep. Naive daddy's girl Baby and macho dancer Johnny are not immediately in sync when they first meet in the 1987 smash hit Dirty Dancing. She thinks he's rude, he thinks she's immature. This matched the tone of the relationship between stars Grey and Swayze off-screen too. Swayze later told the American Film Institute that much of the film's training montage was taken from sessions in which Swayze, a trained dancer, really was trying to teach Grey the right moves. All that frustration on his face is pretty much real. Grey later described their relationship on the Dirty Dancing set as a very complex dynamic. It didn't help that the two had previously spent eight weeks in a military training camp preparing for their roles in the World War III movie Red Dawn. Grey felt Swayze took his group leader role too seriously in that production, ordering everyone else around. When she was cast in Dirty Dancing, she even secretly hoped he wouldn't get the part of Johnny. I'll never be sorry. She's taking my heart. Neither will I. However, the two ultimately found a level of professional respect. Grey appreciated that Swayze promised he would protect her, which helped the nervous actress through their big lifts. And to AFI, Swayze described Grey as one of the most gifted actresses around. He added, That's what made her character really, really special. Shakespeare once wrote that the course of true love never did run smooth, and neither did the relationship between the two actors who brought one of his greatest plays to the screen. Claire Danes was only 17 when she appeared in Baz Luhrmann's 1996 Shakespeare adaption, Romeo and Juliet. Her co-star Leonardo DiCaprio, meanwhile, was 21. However, Danes was said to be put off by what she saw as DiCaprio's immaturity, particularly the pranks he would pull on the cast and crew. Between takes, they totally ignored each other. DiCaprio maintained his prankster reputation after moving on to play a now equally famous star-crossed lover. During production on Titanic, he and his co-star Kate Winslet even bonded over pranks. As DiCaprio's Titanic co-star Billy Zane put it, if he wasn't rolling back his eyelids, he was making objet d'art out of bodily fluids. While Winslet apparently found this hilarious, Danes had had more than enough after the Romeo shoot ended. She was even approached to star in Titanic opposite DiCaprio, but turned the part down. She later claimed that she wasn't ready for the attention such a big project would bring. There may have been more to those awkward silences than hatred, however. Miriam Margulies, who played Juliet's nurse, has since claimed that Danes had a big crush on her older co-star, who handled it insensitively and simply tried to stay away from her. Although it takes a world war and a broken engagement for the central couple in The Notebook to get together for good, the sparks between Noah and Ali are immediate. Unlike their characters, however, it took years for the actors to fully warm up to each other. Neither Rachel McAdams nor Ryan Gosling were the studio's first choices for their roles. Their chemistry helped them land the parts, but it didn't guarantee an easy shoot. Director Nick Cassavetes later recalled that while they were shooting a big scene with lots of extras, Gosling asked him to have a different actress stand out of shot and read McAdams' lines. He allegedly said, I'm just not getting anything from this. Cassavetes ultimately pushed the pair to resolve their conflict for the sake of the shoot by letting them air their respective issues in a shouting match. Cassavetes remembered, The rest of the film wasn't smooth sailing, but it was smoother sailing. The Notebook was released in summer 2004 and became an instant classic. By 2005, Gosling and McAdams weren't just on speaking terms, they were officially dating for real. That year, they even won the MTV Movie Award for Best On-Screen Kiss. For that rain-drenched moment in The Notebook, Gosling's and McAdams' romance ended in 2007, however, and it sounded stormy to the bitter end. Gosling told GQ, We both went down swinging and we called it a draw. Despite spending much of the late 90s and early 2000s as the go-to, charmingly bumbling rom-com hero, there's no love lost between Hugh Grant and most of his co-stars. Grant himself once freely admitted on an episode of Watch What Happens Live, No, I'm a nasty piece of work and I think people should, <laughs> should know that. Grant's self-awareness about his real-life negative effect on women potentially peaked in an interview with Elle in 2009. Asked to give three adjectives about several of his former co-stars, he said that Julianne Moore, Rachel Weisz, and Drew Barrymore loathe, despise, and hate him, respectively. Grant added another name to that list in 2015 on Watch What Happens Live 2, saying that Julia Roberts might also hate him because, I've probably made too many jokes about the size of her mouth. At least one person appears to have forgiven Grant's rudeness, however. Although Grant made Barrymore cry on the set of music and lyrics, he guessed it on her talk show in 2021. 
During the segment, they revealed that, a few years after the movie had come out, they had accidentally made out in a New York restaurant. Seth Rogen and Katherine Heigl got on well during the filming of their unplanned pregnancy comedy, Knocked Up. Rogen even said on a 2016 edition of The Howard Stern Show, As we were making the movie, honestly, I was like, I would make a dozen movies with her. Heigl had a slightly different take, though. Her problem wasn't with Rogen, but with aspects of the character she was playing. An uptight, career-driven reporter who gets pregnant after a one-night stand with a slacker played by Rogan. Heigl told Vanity Fair that she disliked that Knocked Up paints the women as shrews, as humorless and uptight, and it paints the men as lovable, goofy, fun-loving guys. She added that the movie was definitely a little sexist. If this had happened today, Heigl's comments might be praised. But in 2008, she was branded as ungrateful, rude, and difficult. Rogan described her comments as crazy and said he was disappointed not to get an apology, although Heigl had publicly apologized. In 2016, Heigl said again that she regretted the comments and that she would work with Rogan if he wanted to work with her. A few months later, Rogan publicly revealed that he no longer held a grudge against her. When Hollywood newcomer Sean Young was cast in the sci-fi epic Blade Runner, she hoped that her co-star Harrison Ford would offer her some support. After all, Ford was already a household name thanks to his roles in Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Young was especially looking for guidance during the pair's love scene. However, she later recalled, Harrison wasn't particularly generous that way. The scene between Young's replicant, Rachel, and Ford's replicant, Hunter, Rick Deckard, was so violent that the crew referred to it as the heat scene. It wasn't just Ford that Young took issue with on the Blade Runner set. She later told the Daily Beast that director Ridley Scott deliberately shot their sex scene in a way that heightened Young's discomfort because she'd rejected his advances. She said, I think it was Ridley's none-too-subtle message that he was getting even with me. Their bad blood came to the fore again in 2017, when Young's part in the sequel, Blade Runner 2049, was limited to a 30-second appearance as a hologram. Imagine landing your first lead role in a romantic comedy, opposite one of the most famous actresses of the moment. Then you get to set and find out, from her, that she didn't want you to get the job. Jay Moore lived that wonderful scenario in real life, when he was cast alongside Jennifer Aniston in 1997's Picture Perfect. On an episode of his podcast, More Stories, Moore recalled that the first scene he and Aniston had to shoot together involved them making out. His first encounter with Aniston that day was when she walked past him with director Glenn Gordon Karen. According to Moore, Aniston said to Karen, Six guys they screen test, and then she points at me and goes, the one f***ing guy I hate. Of course, the issue may have been that one of those other guys was Aniston's then-boyfriend, Tate Donovan. Moore said that this animosity continued for the rest of the shoot. He later told Elle that Aniston would audibly complain about him to the other actors in between takes. He said, Jennifer Aniston was so f***ing mean to me that I drove to New Jersey, I put my head in my mother's lap, and I f***ing cried. Just because you're playing soon-to-be exes doesn't mean you have to treat your co-star with ex-level hostility. Dustin Hoffman took his notorious character immersion too far, however, while filming the divorce drama Kramer vs. Kramer. On the movie's shoot, Hoffman used real-life bullying tactics to try to intimidate Meryl Streep, who was playing his on-screen ex-wife. Hoffman and Streep got off to a bad start when they first met at her audition for a Broadway play he was directing. Whatever exactly happened, Hoffman apologized and Streep accepted it. But the real trouble started when the two made Kramer vs. Kramer. Hoffman repeatedly made comments about Streep's boyfriend, John Cazal, who had recently died from lung cancer. He shouted at her when she requested changes to the script. And in a scene in which the couple is fighting in an Italian restaurant, he shocked Streep by suddenly throwing a wine glass against the wall. In another fight scene, he spontaneously slapped her across the face, leaving red marks. Hoffman has acknowledged that he was venting emotions brought about by the real-life divorce he was going through during the shoot. This weak explanation wasn't helped, however, when in 2017, multiple women accused him of sexual assault and harassment. In Breakfast at Tiffany's, the relationship between the two metaphorical drifters, Holly Golightly and Paul Varjak, sparkles like the diamonds inside that iconic jewelry store. But off-screen, Audrey Hepburn found George Pappard pompous, according to the movie's co-producer, Richard Shepard. He recalled, there wasn't a human being that Audrey Hepburn didn't have a kind word for, except George Pappard. For his part, Pippard dismissed Hepburn as uptight and prudish, calling her the happy nun. As the breakfast at Tiffany's shoot continued, Pippard constantly tried to make his character, not Hepburn's, the center of the movie. He refused to take directions that he thought made Paul unlikable, and almost came to blows with director Blake Edwards. Renowned actor and director Laurence Olivier was initially excited to work with the superstar Marilyn Monroe on 1957's The Prince and the Showgirl. 
he would be directing and starring opposite the actress, who was fast becoming the most in-demand woman in Hollywood. And he was initially charmed by her too. Olivier later recalled, When I first met her, I thought she was the most enchanting thing I'd ever met in my life. I thought she was such a witty actress, as well as being so ravishingly lovely. Monroe certainly had a remarkable quality on screen, not just in the way she looked, but in her comic timing too. Directors were keen to use that magic and the star power it afforded her to boost their projects, but the price they paid was putting up with Monroe's maddening habits. She was often late to set, for example, which would hold up the shoot. And whereas Olivier was trying to make a straightforward comedy, Monroe, following her training, insisted on being given a more intellectual meaning for each line. Monroe didn't care for her co-star and director either. She even blamed him for her lateness, saying, If you don't respect your artists, they can't work well. Respect is what you have to fight for. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.